first of all, thank you very much for uh, having this interview with us. Um, yeah. And the first question is quite simply, what's your name and what do you do? That's a hard one. <laughs> um, my name is Jeff Garner and I do sustainable fashion, both men's and women's couture. Um, can you talk us through a bit of your journey? What's led you to where you are now? How much time do we have? No. Um, simply, you know, uh, since I was young, very young, I learned that I wanted to do fashion. Through sketching and ideas, I get dresses in my visions. So when I sleep, um, or daydream, or I might do it right now, I don't know. Um, so, you know, I, I had to spit it out. So either I would run from my passion or my dream and go to the corporate world or something that, you know, should be doing, or I do what I love. So that's how I began. Um, can you talk us through a bit of your day to day? What's what's a normal day in the life of Jeff? That's scary. There's no normal <laughs> day, is there? Um, you, when I'm in design mode, um, I typically design by the fireplace and uh, just sketch away. And it usually happens. I usually spit it out like three three nights, and then I go to the sample board and I start you know draping and doing patterns and whatnot and. Uh, you know, but before that, you look for fabrics, and then you get, you know, maybe you find a fabric, you touch it, and you see a dress off of it. I mean, it's there's no really, you know, way of doing it. And then, you know, obviously you have sales. You know, you have to market yourself. You have, you know, speeches like this, and we hope hopefully get back. And so there's not really a normal day, so to speak. And I think that's the beauty of it: is that you're always growing and learning and moving forward. So do you, um, you said you sort of designed by the fire, do you work with a team, do you work from home, how, how does your... Sure, no, I, I design at my, my farm, just me alone, and then I have a team of uh, sample makers that I work with, that I, you know, it's about communication and translation, um, I have one lady who's worked uh, with me since the beginning, and then um, I have another lady, and uh, she says to call her, you know, the mature lady, uh, but she's a sweet, you know, southern lady. And then um, we just work well together, so we're a good, strong team. And then I, um, you know, hire on publicists and you know, anybody I need, I kind of contract them out because uh, we're still a small company. So. Awesome. Um, how did you get into ethical fashion? I know that you said that you uh, used to work for Calvin Klein. Mm -hmm. Quite a big jump to what you do now. How, how did you get into the ethical? Side of fashion. Sure. Um, so I, I, like you guys are talking about tonight, you know, I learned through internship, internships and mentorships, and so Calvin was one, and Johan G. Lennonberg was another, and so after I felt like I learned enough, I was like, all right, time to start my own. So I jumped ship, and then when I started doing production for the very first time in L.A., Los Angeles, I learned very quickly that it was kind of dark and dismal and just, you know, the chemicals I couldn't even print my own shirts and be around it for the off-gassing that happened after going through the heaters. Um, I was like, oh, there's got to be a different way. I started asking questions, and then, you know, everybody was like, no, this is the way we do it. I was like, oh, there's got to be another way. So it's like math science, learning, like, okay, instead of this plastisol ink with this, you know, with this printing, so I went to whoever makes the, you know, the actual plastisol, um, and said, can we do it with an organic compound versus this, and said, Hmm, yeah, let's give it a go. Same thing with fabrics, like, hey, you know, can you use this, you know, this hemp is kind of thick, nobody's going to want to wear this, it's, it, you know, it's too starchy and whatnot, can we, oh, how do we soften it naturally, oh, baking soda, so, you know, all these things, like, we used to know how to do, you know, when they used to set dyes, they took guys out from the bar and they'd, they'd pee on them, that's how they set the dyes, you know, naturally, but, you know, not that I, I do that or anything, but, you know, there, it's already been, you know, if you study back in history, we've already, we already know all this stuff, so it's just re-implementing it in a new way now. Um, you were talking earlier a bit about how you grow some of your, like, the natural dyes on your farm. Mm -hmm. What do you grow? And also, um, do you find it hard to implement that on a larger scale? Sure, that's a great question. So, simply, we grow a few, few of the, you know, marigold flowers for yellow tones and such, and Japanese indigo, the easier plants, and then we work with other um, community gardens, and then farmers and whatnot, whatever we need, we kind of reach out in our community, pull in from that. So, in essence, they could grow more, 
so we could scale it if we needed to, and they would be happy to, because it's another cash crop for farmers. Tobacco industry is kind of done in the South, so we do moonshine, but you know. Um, so yeah, we could scale it, and then I was telling somebody this earlier, so I've been working with a girl, a gal in LA in the machinery that does all the synthetic dyes. We figured out how to use natural dyes in those machines. So before you'd hand cut like five yard increments and dip them in the dye vats, and it's all hand done. So you imagine in, in the synthetic dye world, they do it by rolls. So again, you know, we figured out a way. So you just kind of, what's the problem and figure out the solution. So kind of Da Vinci. Um, was there anyone who was particularly influential in teaching you how to be ethical and mm. any ethical practices, or was it literally just picked up? Like yeah, I think it was just, uh, you know, I've always challenged things in life, I've been that kind of mind. So um, it's been a, an amazing learning curve. So it wasn't one particular person. I did work with a line con con called Convoy in Los Angeles. It was um, playing around with sustainable fabrics and whatnot. And I learned a little bit from them, and then, you know, and then doing a project with Whole Foods, I learned, you know, more of my own research. And, you know, it's, you always, every day is, is a learning day, right? Um, are there still areas of the ethical fashion that you'd like to explore that you haven't? Um, I mean, are there sort of limitations to how ethical your collection is? Sure, there's always limitations. You, you can only do so much. I mean, you know, I used to do my cell calls in the Prius, and you know, we try to think through it all. Okay, well, you know, not just you know the fabrications, but the dyes, and okay, how you set the dyes, not using the metals, you know, the, the mordants, and then how do we package it? Some stores wanted us to plastic wrap, like we're not going to do that, but we can use corn, you know, plastic. There's, there's, you know, and everything in which you do, there could be a more sustainable way. Obviously, it adds to cost and that kind of. Thing. So, ideally, it'd be to figure out cheaper ways of you know manufacturing and doing it. So things like the dye vats using that machinery will help the cost of actually hand cutting and dyeing it, you know to dye it yourself that kind of stuff. So I think that's um, more to be learned and explored. So hopefully your generation. You know, yeah, exactly. And there's more colors, obviously. Yeah, of uh, so um, I know that when you talk about um, synthetic fabric and the fact that um, it's bad for you to wear it, sure. um, do you also give consideration to uh, the other people that are affected by fashion? So, for instance, the people that grow cotton and that sort of thing. Does that come into the into your own personal ethics of your brand? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. There's, there's two ways of looking at it. One is what it does to the environment and what it does to the human body. What's been talked about, you know, if you look at organic food, for example, Whole Foods is here now, people are talking about it, buying it. You know, it's a big, big thing now. Well, it's because selfishly, somebody is putting something inside their body, so they're gonna pay more for it, and they're gonna know more about it. So what's happening in the fashion world is that, you know, people, it's not really about they're not thinking about the farmers, are they, when they're buying Whole Foods, where it comes from, or maybe so, but as long as it's organic, it's okay, but they're not thinking about, okay, it's not polluting the stream, that kind of stuff, so same with the world of fashion. If we can educate and create that awareness and say, oh, all right, what you're wearing tonight, you know, it's off-gassing right now, so it's putting X, Y, and Z and these carcinogens in your bloodstream, so it could link to this cancer, this or that, and so if you want to take that risk, fine, you know, but there's an alternative way. So instead of buying your groceries, you know, I don't know, I don't know, Tesco maybe, I guess, um, versus Whole Foods, okay, you save a little bit of money, but you can pay for it later in your, your health bills and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's the next, I think, step is to bring that awareness closer to home and saying, because actually when you digest your food, a lot of the toxins are taken out through your body naturally, but what you put on your body sucks right into your blood vessels. It doesn't go through a filtration process. So you can imagine the metals and whatnot. You look at the kids now, what they're dealing with, you know, their ADD and their this and their that, and then they're taking this drug to offset it. It's like, well, it's a combination of probably cleaning products, food, and what you're wearing. So it's just another piece of the puzzle, I think. Um, what advice would you give 
to someone that wanted to get into ethical fashion? I'd say strap your boots on tight. Um, no, I, I would encourage them and say, you know, follow your gut and your heart on it and um, keep asking questions. Don't stop when somebody gives you an answer. Learn, learn firsthand and uh, keep striving for more because there's more to be found. And a lot of people stop when, you know, you know H&M is doing eco collection, but it's organic cotton and it's synthetically dyed. And I'm kind of against cotton because of water usage. And, so there's better alternatives, but they'll kind of do whatever is has a key marketing phrase, and they'll just output that. So if we challenge it more and more, then we'll kind of force that you know shift to happen. So people will be like, oh yeah, that's that's not really right. So. What do you think um, the future holds for the fashion industry in terms of ethics? I think one day you'll you'll see that guy walking down the street and be like. I can't believe he's wearing a polyester shirt. You know, so uh, it would be about the fur anymore. It would be about, you know. No, I, you know, I think more and more the people wear it, they'll realize, wow, it breathes well. And like my band guys, I make them hemp v-necks like the Jonas Brothers. And they're like, Jeff, I can wear it in the bus. I can wear it to bed and play in. It doesn't smell like, yeah, it's anti bungo you know. It doesn't, it's not supposed to. And they're like, oh, wow, it's brilliant. So I think more and more people will explore the properties of natural fibers and benefits of natural dyes as well, so they'll, they'll you know, buy more, hopefully. Do you think it'll ever get to a stage where it's really ethical, or it's just another way of um, branding? You, you know, you always have that, that branding element, so it's like, hopefully the independent guys that can stay alive, can keep having that voice over here saying, you know, this is how you do it, because somebody will always take it and mass produce it. You know, like on that film, the Calvin Klein guy was like, you know, you can't compete with these guys that are mass producing. I mean, we, we cannot, but you know, I'll be that annoying little bee that says, mm, you know, this is this is way forward. So, and I think more and more activists that are actresses are in the limelight, kind of take hold of it and learn to educate some more and dress and try to talk to them like we are now. And like, I didn't know that, Jeff. And so they can talk from a standpoint and then when they wear the dress and they're in the interviews, they can talk about it. So. Yeah, it's like a domino effect, so hopefully.